In this lecture segment, we'll discuss some Unix system calls for creating and managing processes. Let's start by uh, clearly defining what we mean by process. In Unix, or any other operating system, a process is a running instance of a program. And that, that's not quite the same thing as just a program, because one program, for instance the VI editor or the C compiler, might have many different simultaneous running instances on the same machine. For instance, if there are multiple users, each running their own VI sessions and compilations. Each running instance is a process. While several processes running the same program would have the same code, and thus the same text segment, they would each have different data segments and stack segments, making them separate instances of the program. A fair number of system calls deal with processes, including system calls to create new processes, to track their execution, resource utilization, etc., and to shut them down in an orderly fashion. The operating system kernel has an internal data structure, the process table, usually a big array of structs, that has detailed information on each running process. Unix and most other operating systems identify each running process by an integer process ID. Most system calls that work with processes use a process ID to identify the process in question. You can obtain the process ID for the current running process via a system called getpid. Here's on line 14 here. This returns the current process ID. That's our first example of a system call that deals with processes. Each process is created by some other process. Processes this have a parent-child relationship. There is one grandparent process called init. It has process ID number 1, and that is automatically started at system boot. It has no parent. We'll talk more about init in a little bit. So, how does one process create another? Via one of the two most interesting system calls in the Unix API, fork. The other, by the way, is exec, which we'll cover in its different forms in a later topic. As you can see on line 11 of our example code here, it's a simple call to make. It takes no parameters, and it returns an int. But what fork does is quite sophisticated. A fork call duplicates the current process. It might better have been named duplicate me or clone me. The result of a successful fork call is a new child process that's a perfect duplicate, including code, global data, heap, RTS, a perfect duplicate of the parent process that created it. It's important to understand the impact of such a duplication. The child process will begin life, so to speak, with data, heap, and RTS state that are exactly as if it had run from the start and made a fork call, because that's what the parent process state looks like as of the fork call, and that state is duplicated in the child. After that, the child runs independently, and its state and that of the parent process may diverge. The child doesn't actually run from the start of main, but it thinks it did, since its heap, RTS, etc., are just as if it had done so. It's a little like one of those Star Trek episodes where someone steps into the transporter and, due to some glitch, is duplicated into two people, each with identical bodies and memories. The duplicate thinks he's the original since he has all the original's memories. Both the original and the duplicate step out of the transporter, thinking, wow, that was weird, and uh, who's that other guy that looks like me? In our code example, this means that while one process, the parent, calls fork, two processes, parent and child, return from that call. One call results in two returns in two different processes. We can try to diagram that a little bit here, thus. On the left here, let's assume we have the parent process returning from the fork call. And on the right, we have the child process, identical, and returning from the fork call. The parent really is returning from the fork, and the child thinks that it is, too. This takes some practice to correctly visualize, since we're so used to seeing a given body of code as one running process. Perhaps this diagram dividing the two will help. 
So always remember that after a successful fork, there'll be two processes, each running the same code, with initially identical data, though again their data may start to diverge after the fork call. Okay, so then what keeps the two processes from behaving absolutely identically after the return from fork? It turns out there is one difference between the parent and child, and it has to do with the return value of fork. Fork returns one of three possible values. If it fails, it returns minus one. This can happen, for instance, if a user is allowed only a limited number of processes, which is a common precaution, in fact, and if the fork call would exceed that limit. A successful fork returns the process ID of the newly created child process, or it returns zero. The former return value is what the parent process gets. So he gets a real ID here, informing it of the child's ID. The zero value is what the child process gets. And this is the one and only way in which each transporter duplicate can determine whether it's really the original or just a copy with carefully duplicated memories. But this difference is enough to let us make a major if-else branch based on the fork return and thus cause completely different post-fork behavior in the two processes. Virtually every program that does a fork call tests the fork's return value, as we do here, and behaves very differently depending on whether a non-zero process ID is returned. In our case here, we go down to this else branch in the parent, or a zero is returned, in which case we go down to the else branch here in the child. So an if-else like this uh, lines 11 through 30 in our code example is typical. The first branch handles the unlikely error case and then the second branch is run only by the parent process and the final else branch is run only by the child process. Why duplicate a parent process like this instead of just having a system call that say takes the name of an executable file and simply starts a new process running that executable from the start? Because, as we'll see, it allows a parent and child process to cooperatively set up various configurations before the child goes on to run another program. If the child has all of the parent's knowledge and awareness to begin with, it can set things up before it starts a new program. The aforementioned exec system call, which is actually a family of related calls, does start a different executable from scratch but it's normally called by the child process after some setup is done post-fork, and we'll see that in a later topic. So let's look at the output of the two branches of our fork call. They are two different processes, but since they are both printing to the same screen, their outputs will mingle, as in the diagram here. And so we can see the code in larger resolution. I'll drop the second diagram copy now, and uh, instead, we'll just keep two red arrows going, each one uh, representing the current location of one of the two different processes that are running the same code. And don't forget that those two arrows represent entirely different processes, each with their own copy of all the data. So with our diagram revised here, the parent and the child begin with printf's on lines 14 and 23, respectively. And evidently, the parent gets a bit ahead of the child, printing first, as you can see in the output here. But which one runs faster is unpredictable. The child might have gone first in a different run. There are different processes, and the CPU may run one or the other, depending on how the operating system schedules it. This is an important principle, by the way. Two different processes may run at unpredictably different speeds. A surprising number of bugs in multiprocessing code, and especially multi-threading code, a, a later topic, result from this fact. The parent process announces the process ID, and from now on we'll just call that the PID, of the child, as well as its own. So apparently it has PID 13880 and the child 20876. The parent then drops into the uh, for loop on... Uh, lines 15 through 17 here, and gets at least a start on it before the child process finally completes its first printf. You can see the parent at zero here. And then the child printf comes after that, uh, and we have child has ID 
2876, mirroring what the parent said. So we get to question one here. Line nine does a uh, printf, as you can see here, buffer up a bit of output. And uh, we can see that that shows at the start of the output from line 14 in the parent. That's not surprising. Line 9's output would have been buffered by the printf call because it's an incomplete output line. Recall our earlier lectures on the standard I.O. library and buffering of incomplete lines. So when line 14 finishes the output line, the buffered line 9 output and the line 14 output get uh, printed uh, together. But why is it also printed at the start of the child's line 23 output? Didn't we say earlier that the child does not start from the beginning of Maine, but instead is a duplicate that starts life at the fork call with a copy of the parent's data? Did the child also do line 9 up here? And why, if so? Stop and think about that. The answer is, the child never ran line 9. The reason it showed the line 9 output is that the printf, or standard output buffer, is part of the data that is duplicated by fork. So the child started life at line 11, here, on the return from fork, thinking, yeah, I just did a partial line printf. Look, you can see it in my standard out buffer. But that's just a duplicated memory. Line 9 is only executed once by the parent. In the child, it's just an implanted memory. This stuff really does get sort of science fictionish. Uh, this case with its implanted memory metaphor is reminiscent of some Philip, Philip Dick novel like uh, We Can Remember It For You Wholesale, uh, on which the better-known movie uh, Total Recall was based. Science fiction aside, though, it's a good example of the subtlety of fork and of multiprocess reasoning. So proceeding on through the code branches for the parent and child, we can see that uh, each of them does a similar loop on lines 15 through 17, or uh, 24 through 28 here. Now, these are just busy work loops. They count up to 200 uh, and then announce as each multiple of 50 is uh, reached by the modulo test there. And to be redundantly clear, both are running at the same time in different processes. The interwoven child and parent output down here on lines 38 and 39, for instance, illustrates that fact. But the child's version is designed to be a little bit slower than the parent's. This sleep system call on line uh, 27 makes the calling process stop running for the number of seconds specified by its parameter. This ensures that the child pauses for one second after each 50 counts, so the parent finishes well, below, uh, well before the child. Now, technically that's not guaranteed. A bizarre fluke of CPU scheduling might still cause the parent to run so slowly that the child beats it despite four uh, sleep calls, but that's vanishingly unlikely. So, as you can see from the output, the uh, parent finishes its loop entirely before the process even gets to account number 50. Now, if we commented out lines 19 and 20 here, which we'll talk about in a little bit, then the parent process would perform the uh, line 18 printf, announcing its completion, and then proceed on to line 31 down here, and end. The child would work through the rest of its slower loop and ultimately reach line 29 and return from main and end as well. We'll look at the 42 in a little bit. But that's not the way parent-child process pairs usually interact. Generally, a parent checks for the completion of its children. It might be that the children are doing some subcomputation on which the parent relies or that a child process is running command on behalf of a parent uh, shell process, and the parent shell needs to wait for each command to complete before starting the next. Even if there's no practical reason for a parent to wait till its child processes end, it's considered good form for it to do. Management of processes is more orderly if the e 
each parent ensures that any child it created via fork, uh, any children it created by a fork, end properly. In the next lecture segment, we'll look at how that's done with this wait call on line 19.